Hi. Before I start, I want to thank you so much for all the support you gave me under the previous video. And thanks to Triblu Amraun for showing me that uh, he believes in this project too. It doesn't matter if I haven't made it to the finalists. As long as I am considered the Mario that teaches calculus, I'll keep moving forward. Anyway, today we talk about optimization, which is that part of calculus that studies how to choose inputs in order to result in the best possible outputs. Needless to say, the applications of this are a lot. I invite you to watch this video of AlphaOpt, where some applications of this discipline are introduced. They are so cool, and I had the hype just to hear them listed. So, let's get started. Let's begin our discussion with a simple straight line. The equation we use to describe it is y equals to mx plus q. This m will be the fulcrum of our discussion. The angular coefficient is in fact what determines the slope of our line, orientating it upwards when it is positive and downwards when it is negative. Also, when it is equal to zero, our line is perfectly horizontal. To find the value of m, we take two points of the line, with coordinates x1, y1 and x2, y2. We evaluate the differences between the coordinates and then we make the division between these differences. Because of this, m is also called the incremental ratio. Now, if a function passes between those points, the y's will not be random, but they will be those of the function evaluated in x1 and x2. And this will change the formula of m. In fact, in this way we have just found the angular coefficient of a line secant the function. If we want to find the m of a tangent line instead, we can use the same formula, but we have to make the two points so close together that they will appear to be one. The angular coefficient of the tangent line to a function evaluated this way is called derivative. Now, you are probably wondering why you should even care about this. But before I show you, let's highlight a couple of things. First, due to the way m is evaluated, we can rewrite its formula as delta f over delta x. But for derivatives, we replace delta with d underlying the fact that the differences between the two points are very, very small. Second, given a function f, you can predict the slope of every tangent line to f for every value of x, because, and this is the fundamental part, the derivative of a function is itself a function that we call f prime of x. This allows us to find m in a much easier way without making a single incremental ratio, because it's enough to evaluate f prime to the point where the line tinges the function. However, today I won't talk about the way to find the derivative functions, although it is required to solve our exercises. Instead, I want to focus on answering the question why do we care about derivatives? While the applications are a lot, but today, I want to analyze the most intuitive one. In fact, if we take a function, we see that as long as the function itself is increasing, the tangent lines have a positive slope, because they are going upwards. And when it is decreasing, they have a negative slope, because they are going downwards. This indicates that thanks to derivatives, we can predict where the function will rise until it reaches the maximum peak, and where it will fall until the minimum peak. This part of calculus is called optimization and allows us to find the maxima and minima of a function by simply setting the derivative equal to zero. There is, however, a problem. If we do not have the graph of the function to help us, when we solve the equation f prime of x equal to zero, how do we understand if the solutions found correspond to a maximum or a minimum of the function? To understand this, the second derivative will help us. In short, let's say that if the first order derivative approximates the function to a first degree polynomial, which is in fact a straight line, the second order derivative approximates the function to a second degree polynomial, that is a parabola. 
Just as with F prime for the line, the sign of F second determines the upward or downward trend of the parabola. So, if the second derivative evaluated in the extreme point is negative, then this means we are dealing with a maximum point, because it acts as a vertex for a downward parabola. If it is instead positive, then it is a minimum point, because it acts as a vertex of an upwards parabola. Although the second derivative method is not widely used for one variable functions, this becomes fundamental for multivariable functions. In fact, we will now extend the concept to more dimensions. If we consider a two variable function, which I briefly talked about in the previous video on double integrals, we can extrapolate from it a curve in an interval of x, keeping the y as a constant. Then we can find the slope of the tangent line to this curve. This is what we call a partial derivative, and we can set it equal to zero to find the maximum or the minimum of the curve. Obviously, we can repeat the process while keeping the x as a constant and the y as a variable, obtaining a curve and a partial derivative both in y. As you can imagine, to find the extreme point of a function of two variables, we must look for a point that zeroes both partial derivatives at the same time. And then, we must see which point makes null what is called the gradient, a fictitious vector that has as components the partial derivatives of f. Following the same logic as before, to understand if the extreme point is a maximum or a minimum, we could approximate the function to the three-dimensional analog of a parabola, that is, an osculating paraboloid. In theory, it all sounds very nice, but there is a problem with this approximating figure. In fact, in the equation of a paraboloid, there are several parameters that together determine its trend. For some of their values, the extreme of this paraboloid is a maximum point, while for others, a minimum point. For some values, you can even create a point that seen from one direction acts as a maximum, and from another acts as a minimum, making the paraboloid look more like a saddle. If we can have so many possible configurations, how can we create a forecast based on these parameters? Well, let's start by arranging them inside a symmetrical matrix and see what happens. The trick is in fact to study the sign of this matrix so that we can understand the trend of the paraboloid. In practice, we pretend we are still dealing with a parabola, with which in fact it was enough to see the sign of the coefficient of x square. How can we do this? And how is this matrix connected to the study of maxima and minima? Well, due to some demonstrations regarding Taylor polynomials that I cannot show you right now, we can see that if a function of one variable can be transformed this way, thanks to the second derivative, a two-variable function can be transformed this way, thanks to all the second partial derivatives. These derivatives, and we notice it from a comparison with the equation of the paraboloid, are precisely the coefficient we were talking about before. So, we can put them in a matrix, called the Eschen matrix, and study its sign. But again, how do we do this? Well, let's apply what is called the Descartes rule, which allows us to find the sign of the matrix through the sign of its eigenvalues. In fact, from this rule we learn that if both eigenvalues are negative, we are dealing with a maximum point. If they are positive and negative, with a saddle and if both are positive, with a minimum. This is a very useful technique, but we could ask ourselves, can it happen that we have a null eigenvalue? <laughs> yes, it can. This case is particular because it makes the Hessian method inconclusive, since we are unable to understand the sign of the matrix. So, how do we get out of this? Well, we have to use a trick that it's easier to explain if we go back to 2D. In fact, let's imagine we want to classify an extreme point of a one-variable function. We only know that at this point the function has a value, that we call c. 
we have to admit that we are helping ourselves by watching this curve. But a person who doesn't have access to this graph, how can he know if this point is a maximum or a minimum? Well, if he is smart, he might search for a clue. Ask him something like, if I shift the function by C, will the extreme be in a positive or a negative region? Ok, maybe he is too smart. Let's follow his reasoning step by step. We could in fact start by creating a function that we call f bar, equal to f minus c. Obviously, this function will be equal to f, except for the fact that it is lowered or raised by c, and that at the extreme point this f bar is equal to zero. Now, if this function is negative in a neighborhood of that extreme, then we are dealing with a maximum point, because this means that all the other points have a y that values less than zero. But if in that neighborhood it's positive, then the extreme is a minimum, because all the other points give values greater than zero. It is as simple as well as ingenious technique, because we rely on the study of the sign rather than on derivatives to classify the extremes. And this is exactly how it works for a two-variable function. When the Hessian, in fact, has a nulling in value for some points, we have to create for each of these points its f-bar and study its sign. If the extreme point is in a region where f-bar is negative, then it is a maximum point. If it is positive, a minimum, and if it is in a half positive and negative region, a subtle point. Now we have a lot of weapons to use when we study our maxima and minima. But to see if we have understood, let's summarize all these techniques by carrying out just one exercise. Suppose we want to find the maxima and minima of this function. We have to elaborate a method to follow step by step. The first step is in fact to evaluate the gradient and to set it equal to zero. This means that we must make both partial derivatives null, and therefore generate a system of two equations in the two variables x and y. I repeat, in this video I won't show the techniques to find the derivative functions, so it is necessary that you know them to understand the accounts I will do. Otherwise, trust me and the numbers that will come out. So, now that we have created this system, how do we solve it? Well, step 2 says, Factorize and cancel the never null factors. In our case, we factorize and delete the exponential, which is a always positive function. Step 3 is to divide the system into many small systems. In practice, we have to find the x that solves one equation and the y that solves another. This exercise gives us three systems, so it's logical to think that we have found the three extreme points. Well, yes, but notice that factor in x which is present in both equations. This means that for x equal to zero, the whole system vanishes, regardless of the choice of y. And therefore, we have not only one or some extreme points, but infinite, with every possible value of the y-coordinate. This shouldn't certainly surprise us. It simply means that it's not happening a certain thing like this, but rather like this. Now that we have defined the two families of extreme points, we can finally classify them by proceeding to step 4. Find the second derivatives and the actions. I will not show the calculations, but I invite you to verify that the essence of our points can be written like this. Now let's go to the fifth and final step, find the eigenvalues of the actions. For the first point we have negative eigenvalues, and therefore we can say that it is a maximum point. End of the story. For the second, instead, we have null eigenvalues. And therefore, unfortunately, the Hessian method is inconclusive. Do not panic, we can still use the f-bar method for all points of coordinates 0, y. 
in our case, f bar is just the same as f, because the function evaluated in all these points is equal to zero. Therefore, it becomes easier to study the sign. Here too we can remove the always positive terms, useless to determine the sign, which are the exponential and the x squared. We are left with y greater than zero, and this indicates that the function is positive above the x-axis and negative below it. This divides our points into several groups. Those that are below, in fact, because they are in a negative region, are maximum points. Those that are above, minimum. And the origin is the only exception which, because it is in an intermediate region, can only be a subtle point. Well, the video is over. I hope you liked it, I hope you found it uh, exhaustive and not exhausting, and uh, if you have any questions about things I may not have been so clear about, feel free to write them on the comments. If you want, click the like and subscribe button, and share this video with friends that may like this topic. That would be very, very useful to me. Thanks.